Does anyone recognize this artwork? Silicon Valley TV show? Okay, good. That means you won't know anything about this. But it's, uh, I'm in HR, and we've been talking about purpose today. And I was really lucky uh, to kind of find my purpose very early. I, I literally have the, the best job. It is, it's fun. I get to work with people. I get to work with strategy. I get to work with technology. Uh, in my own small way, I, I'm changing the world with every person I hire and every person I work with. And it's, it's wonderful. And, and I found it by accident um, um, 20 years ago. So I, by, I, I have absolutely the best job. I, I, I absolutely do. Actually, that looks kind of important. I think, I think maybe Mark's got the best job. That, that whole make the world more open and connected, like that sounds like a pretty good job. Um, you know, I think maybe my, maybe my job's not so important after all, and I'm a little, little humbled. Maybe Mark's got the best job. Uh, and second thought, maybe Ginny's got the best job. That whole Watson AI thing, fantastic. Could absolutely change the world. Mm, maybe Ginny's got the best job. Yeah, Ginny's definitely got the best job. Oh, hold on, maybe Elon, Kingston, Queens grad. That whole saving the planet thing, that sounds pretty important, right? That's a good gig. Solar, electric cars, probably going to be, that's an important job. And his whole backup plan, getting us to Mars, that's not so bad either, right? That's probably, that's probably a really important job. So that sounds pretty important. Um, now, only here, when I'm back north of the border, can I play this next slide. Um, because only, only this group here will really know who I think absolutely has the best job. And it's the next slide I'm going to show you. Rick Mercer has got the best job. Can we get a round of applause for Rick Mercer? I think he's got the best job on the planet. I still watch him every Saturday morning on YouTube. And I still get to watch what he's up to. And it's, it's just super fun. He's got the best job. And you're all thinking to yourself, What's this all got to do with building a team? So the fun question of the day is, what does Mark, Elon, Ginny, and Rick's job have in common? What does that have to do with hiring? I'm going to tell you that at the very end. I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of great organizations. Um, lately, more in the uh, very small startup space. I love innovation. I love watching teams like this start in, in small places and get going. And organizations really just have need three things to grow. It's really simple. It's hard to execute. We need people. We need capital. We need some kind of compelling product or service, technology. Um, as the teams are working today, they're obviously very focused on capital and getting their product right, getting attention, getting customers, getting people interested in what they're doing. Um, clearly, I'm biased. I think people are the spark and the long-term fuel that sustains an organization. And very quickly, as you move away from, I've got product and I've got capital, you realize I have a people problem. I have to attract people. And so whether the spark starts here, and so if, for those who have been to Silicon Valley, this is the Hewlett Packard plaque right in front of their Palo Alto garage. Whether it starts there, this is the birthplace of Silicon Valley. There, there was actually nothing but orchards there. And it's, it's, it's fascinating. And, and from orchards arose you know, the wonder that is, that is uh, Silicon Valley. But whether it's here, um, whether it's in a coffee shop, any coffee shop. In fact, more and more, I think, a lot of the innovative ideas are happening in coffee shops. Uh, or, or, or whether it's happening right here in the fort. You know, I think. That's the one constant, and Elon said it best. Growing a business is as much about innovation, drive, and determination as the people of the people who do it as the product they sell. So let's get growing. I'm here to talk a little bit about how we build teams. Anyone recognize the Silicon Valley crew? Any HBO, yeah, I saw a little nod back there, thanks, okay. So these guys were incompetent. I needed a fictitious team that I could make fun of while I was doing that this, this, this show today. So this group, depending on the year, they're either doing a compression algorithm software company or they're doing some kind of, uh, this year they're a, they're a chat, video chat based company. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna pretend I've been hired by them and they've asked me to come in and say, Derek, we've got some funding. 
now help us build this team to scale. And so having done this for a number of years, it's kind of like I got to do this little time warp and say, what are the things I wish I knew kind of a decade ago? And what are the tools that would shape and influence me if I was building a team from scratch? And we're gonna have a panel here afterward talking about that. And so over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm gonna walk through the five tools that I leverage and use whenever I'm talking to any entrepreneurial team, whenever I'm talking to any group of founders who are looking to start hiring, the things to think about. And it starts long before you go to Google, look up a job description, and then post a job. I could spend all day talking about that, but it starts long before that. So my challenge to any entrepreneur, it's your squad, five tools. We're gonna talk about life cycle. We're gonna talk about why, what, and who. Style, engagement, and screen for team. So it's interesting. Um, every organization that I've ever worked with goes through a predictable lifestyle cycle. Every company does. Every company I've ever talked to, uh, I've been able to sit and talk to them about, like, where are you in your life cycle? What's going on? And they'll describe to me their experiences. They'll describe to me their challenges. They'll describe to me uh, all, the, all the different things that they are facing at that point in time. And Pied Piper, our fictitious company, uh, is no exception. They're very much in the early stage. And your role as a leader, as you think about moving through a life cycle, is your ability to work together as a team and quickly tackle any and all situations, or not to, is your ultimate competitive advantage. This model here is from Adizes. I highly recommend anyone who's building any team at all spend some time looking at it, reviewing it, studying it. The idea is very straightforward. There's a corporate life cycle that starts on the left, and if you don't manage it properly, it ends as you go around the cycle. Every company I speak to, when they describe to me their problems or challenges, fits somewhere into here. Now, Pied Piper is at the courtship and infancy stage. Everything on that left side is more your venture capital space, right, growth mode. Everything over here on the other side is starting to struggle. Maybe more private equity, definitely in need of some fixing and some rejuvenation. But we're in courtship and infancy. The model actually is fascinating because it talks about the normal type of challenges you face at each stage and the abnormal ones. And I'm gonna pull up a couple of different abnormal and normal challenges from uh, the very simplified from this model. And this is where I get to tell entrepreneurs, you're not crazy. I get to tell founders, you're not nuts. This is normal stuff you are facing in the very early days. You're gonna have no procedures, everything's crazy. Everything's management by crisis. Hands-on leaders are involved, sometimes more than they wanna be, sometimes more than the staff wants it to be. Lack of managerial depth, fast decision-making, founder commitment is tested. Again, this is normal sorts of challenges of the very early stage infancy companies. Some of these organizations just now will be facing this challenge in the next couple of weeks as they get funding and start pursuing their dream. On the abnormal side though, this is more fascinating. Rush to market before ready, excess perfection, can't attract talent, dictatorship style, out of touch leadership, non-supportive family. That bottom line is very interesting. Founder commitment tested, you have got to want it. We've been talking about purpose for the last couple of presentations, that's been a main theme. Knowing that that fuel is coming from within, that you're actually being motivated to do something that is you're powered by is, is, is the fuel you need. And having the network and the family around you uh, is, is absolutely critical. But in the infancy mode, these are the sorts of things that you are going to face and you're going to have to navigate. It's going to happen. And so the implication on building your team is can the person you're hiring deal with these challenges? Is, can the person you're hiring actually help you navigate these challenges? Will they pull you into the abnormal zone? Will they pull you into areas of distraction? If you're unable to get out of the infancy zone, you never make it to the next space, which is much more exciting. Go-go organizations 
are on fire. They are growing, they have product market fit, things are moving at exponential speeds, you have, you've got your capital, your product works, you are hiring very quickly. Unfortunately, everything seems like a priority. And has anyone ever worked in any of these organizations? It's, it's intoxicating, and that's part of the problem. Everything's a priority, really? Does it need to be? How many meetings do we need to do to align, right? We should have cleaned that up. Could meetings be productive? Leadership gets very frustrated because everything is on fire and running around. There's no consistent HR. Management eh, is sometimes not as strong as you need it to be. There's a house of cards infrastructure, and there's ad hoc budgeting. Again, we're going to come back to the impact on team in just a moment. That's the good stuff. That's the normal stuff. That's going to happen. The stuff you need to avoid is if you continue to go to the good idea of the week, if you drift off purpose, if you drift off why you're in business or what you're doing, that's abnormal. You'll never make it through go-go to the next phase. If you don't put in cost controls, if you're unwilling to hire people better than you, if you've got key people leaving, or if you've got leaders avoiding managing just to do things, or reliance on miracles, you've got a problem. And you need to fix that through hiring. So anyone who, I mean, the real question is always, who do you want on this journey after you've got capital, after you've got product, and you start building teams? Who, where are you on this curve? You have to hire people that you like solving problems with. And you have to hire people who can help you with the future, but can navigate the now. I've seen a lot of organizations where they'll go get very big talent but they really struggle in a much smaller entrepreneurial environment. And so they've got to do both. That's how, you, that's how you future proof your organization. And you have to screen out people who will pull you into the abnormal problems. And when you're interviewing, it's really tempting to just talk about the skills. I guarantee this is more important. So tip one to my poor Pied Piper crew here is you have to know where you are on the life cycle and you have to bring people in who are going to be able to help you through the problems you are going to face. That's the Adizé's model. Number two, the best organizations I've ever worked with, the ones who win great workplaces, they tend to define why they exist, what they're doing, and who's doing it earlier and better than anyone else in the market. Because let's face it, more people means more problems. It's hard to organize larger groups. You were just a group of founders yesterday with six people around you. What are these 60 people doing over here? And it comes up really fast. And so, you know, if I look at this Pied Piper website, which is, uh, if you actually Google Pied Piper, this is the, the TV show website. A middle on compression solution making data storage problems smaller. Who cares? I mean, no, that's not interesting. That's not purpose. That's kind of what you do. And so the age-old thing about vision and mission and values really differentiates and separates the awesome companies that have a great future and some of the companies that really struggle with what are we doing, why are we doing it. And so I invite any entrepreneur very early on to say, who are you and why do you exist as an organization? And it just goes back to vision. And everyone, whenever I'm doing consulting projects, like, I don't understand what this vision thing is. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of confusing. Like, doesn't that sound like mission? So, you know, I literally put the same definition up every single time. If the organization were to achieve all of its strategic goals, what would it look like 10 years from now? And as an entrepreneur, you're like, hey, I just got off the ground here, right? I just got some funding. Like, I don't want to think about this. I just want to live to next week. But I'm telling you, the differentiators between good and great spend time on this as a group. I was working with a recently Series A funded company a couple weeks ago, a uh, fascinating company called Swarm Sales. They are the Uber for enterprise sales. You can imagine that. You just kind of call up a sales force person and have them come work for you. They just show up. Um, and, and they just got funding and the CEO said, like, I really want to spend some time on vision and values because we're starting to hire. And I said, brilliant, that's great, let's spend a day off-site. And they got together and they co-created everything and they, they, they came up with like, a really great set of vision and values uh, and mission. And at the end of the day, I walked over to him and I said, um, there's a couple of people in this room that you know don't pass that test. 
right? They don't really buy into this vision. They don't really exude or exemplify the values that you just wrote. And he kind of looks at me, and I'm going to get in trouble because he's watching right now. But, you know, he looks at me and he goes, no, 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 it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And a couple of weeks later, I run into him, and he looks at me and he goes, you were right, I was wrong. I'm like, okay, good. That's <laughs> but they made the change early. But the, the point is, they built, they spent the time early. The VC was like, don't bother doing that. And yet he was already filtering for awesome on the early days. I'm really quite excited by where he's going to go. But you look at the Smithsonian. And this has changed the world stuff. This is exciting, right? Shaping the future by preserving our heritage, discovering new knowledge, sharing our resources with the world. Wow, I want to be part of that, right? That's an amazing vision. Of course, Google's provide access to the world's information in one click. Okay, well, maybe I'm not that you know, inspired, <laughs> but that's pretty exciting stuff. And I think all of the teams here today have done a very good job of expressing what they want to do. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a great start. If that's vision in the 10-year story, well, you're kind of made up of like multiple missions to get there. So the mission statement, while some people get kind of confused on it, it's really the reason for existence. It describes the company, what it does, but it can change a lot because as the company shifts and pivots and solves problems, you may have two or three missions on the way to your vision. Anyone watch the TED conferences online? Pretty great. I love watching them. I, I'm never qualified to do that, but they do a pretty good job. But spreading ideas is a mission. Uh, public broadcast, PBS, to create content that educate, informs, and inspires. Um, setting that mission, again, when you've got six people working for you, no problem. You talk around the water cooler. You get 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 100, 200, 300. Not everyone's going to make the same decisions you do unless you set up this framework. So the best companies build this to scale from early days. And the values, if you've got kind of why and what, and then you get down to how. How do you want people to behave? Facebook's is kind of legendary. Be bold, focus on impact, move fast, be open, build social value. It can be simple, it can be aspirational. The point is you want to put it down and say, this is what we expect, how we want to interact, how we want to behave, who we are. Because when I go recruiting, they better fit into this. Uh, otherwise, I end up with an organization that I designed, I hired for, and I'm not happy with. And it's not helping me hit my dreams. I've talked to a number of founders, unfortunately, five or six years in, going like, I don't want to work with any of these people anymore. I don't like them. And I kind of go, well, you've got a bit of a problem, don't you? Uh, well, we're going to have to fix that. We're going to have to work through a change plan. I'm always like, just deal with it at the front door, right? If you spend some time on it up front, I mean, it doesn't start with the job description. It starts with answering these questions. And what does it take? A day? Maybe two? And it saves you hours, hundreds of hours, thousands of dollars? It's worth it. Vision, mission, values. And then you get down to this interesting fable and the second resource of the day that I want everyone to remember. It's this book called Scaling Up. And you'll notice that people is actually the first step in that scaling up process. And there's this fable in there that's written by Anonymous. We all remember it from grade school, right? We've all seen this before. There was an important job to be done and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it. Nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anyone could have. Seems simple. And yet, how many times do we hire lots and lots of people, and we don't give goal clarity? We don't make it very clear what you're supposed to be working on. This is actually a real problem, and it just compounds as you add people. Because now the problem is, I'm going to throw more people at the problem, right? Here, here's, here's 20 more people at more cost, and I just keep throwing more cost at the problem. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm still not getting what I want. Well, they still don't know what they're supposed to be doing. And so the question is, as an entrepreneur, you very quickly go from, I got capital, I got product, I got service. Who's doing what? And if you don't spend time doing that, then you're going to run out of money pretty fast. So the best companies spend a lot of time on this. My real point is, don't play bunch ball. Ever never watch soccer games, little kids running around playing soccer? It's fun. It's adorable. That's not how companies are supposed to run. 
right? It's just, that's not cool. I mean, and if you ever sort of step back and watch your company, you may sometimes feel like that's what I'm watching. I'm like, oh my God, I'm watching bunch ball happen. Like everyone just keeps diving on the problem of the day. Um, and you think to yourself, well, how did that happen? Well, the coach, who's the coach? The coach didn't define the positions and how to play together. I'm starting to give you some tips as to how our, our figures at the beginning are all alike. But now you end up with this question, like, okay, great. I got the players, I got the purpose, I know why I'm here. I'm gonna start adding people. And whether you like it or not, you gotta deal with structure. On the left here are some various sort of organizational models. Uh, I'll leave my email address at the end. Anyone who wants this presentation, I'll send it to you. But, but you sort of got to this classic Amazon sort of hierarchy. And you're thinking to yourself, like, really, does this matter? I just got funding. Yes, it does. Because if you end up with like 17 vice presidents because you gave the title away, what are you going to do afterward? How are you going to organize this? And I'm normally on the cleanup side of this occasion, right? In my role, in the consulting role, head of HR, I usually get there a little bit later. And you're like, uh, if someone had only had a time machine to go back and say, think about this first. So Amazon, Google's kind of got this interesting nodes and, and sort of divisions, but they all can talk to each other, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, Facebook, much more, definitely a node-oriented culture. Microsoft, I, I don't know if it's still like this, but this is the common joke. Anyone work for Microsoft? Oh, <laughs> is it still like that? Okay, so for those of you watching, uh, a slight acknowledgement that it may have once been like that a little bit. Um, but, but, you know, different groups siloed off, right? Which is very difficult when you think about, like, a collaborative culture, and, and I understand that was still a little true. Apple, this is kind of what happens. I mean, it was, look, obviously very sad, um, the change of leadership at Apple. But in some ways, this is like an entrepreneurial culture that never really outgrew the founder. And I, I see a lot of this. Uh, and it's, it's something, if you don't deal with it, you end up with the Apple structure, and you're incredibly dependent on one or two or three people. Doesn't scale. And my job here today is to talk about scaling. Oracle, just kind of fun, uh, legal department uh, and, and engineers. But whether that's true or not, I haven't actually been able to, 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 to validate it. But more and more, you know, as, you're get, as, as you get your capital and you get your product working, and you're thinking to yourself, I need to, I need to scale. Does it need to be through employees? Right, we live in a gig economy. How would you structure or potentially structure different nodes, right? Different clusters of people, different sort of workforce networks. There's all sorts of wonderful people and, uh, that, that you can leverage uh, on demand. So just think about how you want to approach getting things done through structure. So our poor people back at Pied Piper, if I was talking to them, I'd say, be the coach. If you don't do it, who else will? And that's, that's a big shift for a lot of entrepreneurs. The best organizations plan early and plan often. They often think of it as like, oh, wait, I'm losing productivity. I've stopped the day. Like, I'm not coding. You're going to go faster. Stop and take a little bit of time to plan. Leverage vision, mission, values, and what needs to be achieved to attract talent. I think from a talent brand perspective, if you've got that compelling story, the best people are going to come to you. Set clear expectations at the org, squad, and individual levels. Again, clear goals. Define how talent will be assessed. And honestly, don't get caught up in just traditional hierarchies. Experiment a little bit. So our friends at Pied Piper are learning. And then I wanted to talk to them about style. Um, and I don't mean this kind of style. There's this wonderful book. It's the third resource I would like to give to you. Pay attention to it. It's Multipliers. Has anyone read this by Liz Wiseman? The concept is very straightforward. Multipliers are people who motivate you, empower you, and are problem solvers, and diminishers are idea killers, energy sappers, and depleters. Who knows a multiplier that you work with, right? Everybody knows some. Who knows a depleter? Yeah. There are six profiles. Again, I've got 40 minutes to talk to you about it, so I'm just going to give you the overview. I get, it's the book you really should spend some time looking at. On the good side, multipliers get two times the capability from the people they work with. Talent magnets makes your recruiting easier. The liberators who create intensity that requires your best thinking. Coaches who extend challenges. Debate makers who debate before deciding. And investors who still instill ownership and accountability. 
Um, anyone who has had a good mentor over the years, and there was some discussion about mentor, probably was from the multiplier side. They just couldn't help themselves. They enjoy that mentorship role. I invite each of you to think about maybe you want to do the same. On the diminishing side, and after you see this, each of you is going to think about somebody. Do not call out any names. I don't want to know. But there are empire builders who hoard and underuse talent, tyrants who create anxiety, know-it-alls who tell people what to do, decision makers who make isolated decisions, and the micromanager, oh yeah, my favorite, who, who loves a micromanager, um, who take over control. They get less than half of what people, uh, people's capability, just by, just by their style. And so my question to maybe this group is, um, how many, from the diminishers, you raised your hands a moment ago, I was like, yeah, I know a diminisher. Now think of prior places you've ever worked at. Are you still friends with those diminishers? And so you're now in charge of hiring teams, right? Um, you're in charge of, you know, definitely building product. You're definitely in charge of capital, but you're in charge of building teams. Why would you stack the deck with anyone who looks like a diminisher? And so style matters, the nod to Steve Jobs and the outfits with the, with the boys. I invite each of you to choose to be a multiplier. Fill the organization with as many multipliers as you can find, right? Well beyond their core skills, how they work. I want you to fill your hiring panels with as many multipliers as you have. Because if you've ever gone to an interview and you've sat down and you've looked across at some disengaged person who's a diminisher, you're like, I don't want to work here. I don't want to be here at all. You can see those people a mile away. And so the sad part, too, is you have to manage the diminishers out of the organization. They drive away the multipliers. Simple concept. The book is amazing. It's a light read. It takes just a little while. But again, as you're building your squad and future-proofing it, and you're thinking about who do I want on this boat with me, multipliers, hands down, 10 times out of 10. How you find them, it's interesting. If you go back a slide, talent magnets who attract and optimize talent. When I'm hiring executives into organizations, there are just some executives who bring their entire teams with them. It's fantastic. Find those people. You'll hire 10 more. All right, tool number four. That's kind of a ridiculous scene. Unicorns, the valley. Uh, but make engagement more than money from day one. And more importantly, you have to decide what you mean by engagement. This is a wonderful model. It's the fourth tool I would like to leave you with today. On the left, it is by a company called Blessing White. It is a consulting company. The concept is straightforward. I was having a conversation off, offline a little bit earlier talking through it, and yet we don't do it naturally. And the concept is straightforward. Under the engagement X, how people are actually motivated. They are not motivated by burritos. They are not motivated by pool tables. They are not motivated by hammocks. They are not motivated by bicycles. They are not motivated by any of those things on the right. Those are nice. That's not what motivates them. But what motivates them is what's on the left. What does the company need? Vision, values, goals. And finding the absolute crossroads <clears throat> of what that individual is looking for individual needs. So if you can find the crossroads of employee success, individual success, what they are looking for, and company interests, you've got highly engaged in people. And if you've got highly engaged multipliers, look out. You only need one or two of those. And I use this model with basically all of my clients and all the organizations I talk to. <clears throat> and the managers, as they start to talk to their employees, start to realize, Gosh, I, I didn't realize I had to pay attention to what people want themselves. I thought I could just tell them what to do and give them goals, and they would do that. And so it's absolutely crystally clear important that you lay this down as the architect of your team, that this is how you're going to define engagement as a culture of achievement and not a culture of entitlement. Got some nodding over there. <laughs> Actually, what's interesting for the cameras at home, there's a lot of people in the audience kind of nodding their heads. I'm like, yeah, you're all thinking about people you know, and you're all thinking about companies you work with. 
I speak the truth. Um, you know, on the disengaged side, you know, it's worth spending a few more minutes. Uh, you know, the almost engaged are people who are like, eh, hey, you're getting me to do things I need to do. And it's kind of in line with what I'm doing. You know, I'd like to, maybe I'd like a break. Um, you know, the honeymooners and hamsters, they're essentially too brand new to know any better. Uh, the crash and burners, unfortunately, are, are people who are not really getting any individual satisfaction at all, but they're just doing the same job over and over again. I think we've had a discussion, you know, a lot today about finding what it is that you want to do and then do it really well. Um, the crash and burners tend to be people who are really struggling with, like, I don't like what I'm doing. I'm on a day job and I'm just kind of doing it because I have to do it. But as a leader, it might be nice having those people there, but they're only half, half valuable. And of course, then the ultimate terrible quadrant to be in the disengaged, right? You're really not doing very much for the company and you're really not very happy either. And hopefully none of you are in those types of roles. And if you are, I encourage you, reset, look at, look at something new to do. But as a leader, this is terrible. You don't want 30 of those people on your bus. So set a culture of achievement right from day one. Make engagement way more than dollars. And it's interesting, you think about it, like all top performers I've ever worked with at any time at all, they tend to prefer achievement over entitlement cultures, right? You like working with teams who are like awesome, that inspire you. We're like, wow, I really learned something from you today. You know, and, and when you're an employee, you're like, okay, well, that's great. But as an architect of the organization and as an entrepreneur, you're the one who's responsible for putting these people on the team. Way more than job description. Define that deal up front. <clears throat> I've been in, again, a few too many orgs that start to try to replicate the Google success. I'm like, I know, I'm going to give them all free lunch. That'll, that'll make me a Google. It's not true. You've got to actually get deeper than that and define the deal. And what are you going to actually get while you're here with my organization? Some of our teams today are so mission and values and purpose driven. Like you want to help them. You want to be part of what they're doing, right? They've, they've got a natural hook. But sometimes you're in organizations where you don't have a natural hook and you've got to look for it a little bit more. The point is, define that deal, work on the brand, offer it up, then deliver it. And I've had to do this a few times myself. I'm, I'm guilty of this. Don't force the fit, right? If someone is not going to make it into the your what I need as an organization and their interests are so outside of what you need to achieve, there's very little you can do to bend that person to, to be successful in your organization. Again, I go back to my example where you know the CEO was looking at me saying, I hate all these people. I don't want to work with any of them anymore. And you know, when you went through it person by person, it was, you shouldn't have hired them. You force fit that. That person was a rock star in their field and not even remotely interested in what you're trying to do in your organization. Um, and he's like, I know, but I couldn't find anybody else. Yeah, but he doesn't want to work for you, <laughs> but you hired him anyways. So you know, it's your job. It's your job to do that. It's the founding team's job to do that. Man, this is the toughest part. While I'm mostly talking about hiring today and I'm mostly talking about scaling your team for growth, part of that is you do have to manage the disengaged up or out. And we all slip into the disengaged mode from time to time. We all get there, we have bad weeks, we have bad months. I'm not saying screw up once and you're out of here. What I'm actually saying is you need to embrace a coaching mindset and really care and cultivate about the health of your organization. And if it's not a good fit for the organization, if the person's just not in it, their interests are not aligned with what you're trying to achieve, it's time to move on. Um, and then it's, you know, call your HR person and we'll figure out how we're gonna do this in a caring way. And of course, my favorite, I've seen this way too many times on engineering hiring panels, Never put the disengaged on a hiring panel. Never, ever, ever. I mean, how many interviews have you walked into before where you looked across and you're like, that person doesn't want to be here either? Never happened to any of you, right? But it's this idea of like, why would I put, why would I put people um, on, in front of other people and try to get them attracted to my org if they're not engaged? Tool five, the last of my tools for the day. Screen for the team. There's a wonderful fifth resource called the five dysfunctions of a team. 
it is absolutely mandatory reading for anyone, any entrepreneur who's starting out building their organization. It's this idea of you've added people to the organization, you've got your goals clarified, you know what the results should look like. But if you don't have trust, you don't know how to fight, and you don't have commitment, you don't have a team, and you're not gonna get your things done. You actually need to tend to this. You have to think about before I hire that next person into my team, what is the impact they're going to have on the mix that I have? What holes do I have in this team already? How would I be able to maybe increase trust or avoid more conflict or solve more conflict by adding different voices to my table? It's your job when you're recruiting. So for my friends at Pied Piper, I would tell them, what's missing? And of course, I look at this group, and right away I think to myself, that's five guys. There needs to be a lot more diversity on this team to be successful or to work through conflict, and to build trust. I think diverse teams are by far stronger teams. Uh, so I, I enjoy picking on this example. But fix the dysfunction. The talent can see it. Diversity over ho homogeneity. And who you hire affects everything. Down to my last couple of minutes. So I'm going to go back to my fun question. What do Mark, Elon, Ginny, and Rick's job have in common? And what does it have to do with hiring? Anyone got the answer? Anyone figured out what I'm doing? Leadership. It's the best job. It comes in all sorts of formats. It's my job. I love doing it. But these are people who all choose to attract and inspire people around them and do amazing things through people. And the biggest thing I can leave everyone with, any one of the teams here in your day-to-day day -day jobs, anyone you're working with, whenever you become a leader and as soon as you embrace being a leader, building your team to scale starts with you taking the same leadership lead before you write that job description. So when, Der when everyone says, Derek, how do you build a team to scale? I walk them through these five tools, but it all starts with you have to decide you want to be an awesome leader. It is part of your job, and the day you become an entrepreneur, it is, is you start to spend more and more time on this than you do on the product you built or on the capital you raised. So, I leave you with, it's your squad. Take the leadership leap. I'll leave you with these five tools to scale your team from your first hire, if anyone was writing them down. You can always, I'll, send, I'll leave my email address up in a moment. But the life cycle from Adizes, know where you are in the life cycle. Scaling up starts with why, what, and who. Style of the team, multipliers. Engagement, Leadership X, it's a seven minute video on YouTube. It's in that wonderful sort of handwritten sort of storyline. It is super entertaining and you'll learn a lot about how to keep people in the apex of the engagement zone. And the five dysfunctions of a team, screen for team, it is mandatory reading uh, for any entrepreneur. That's all I've got. I invite everyone to take the leadership leap and that's how you scale your team. My email, my address, if you have any questions, if you'd like a copy of the presentation, by all means, I'll send it to you. I love building teams. It's been great to be here today.